here for the first time this morning. So y'all know this is Lila. <laughs> she walks over and grabs the microphone. <laughs> okay, we're going to start this morning. And um, as you know, our team, our music team is across the street. So Lila's going to start and we're going to really get into it as soon as they get back over here. Amen. So, Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're going to listen to Ireland for a minute. The one we just started there.
One of the things that I discovered about the cultural sounds is in intercession, I always say that there are four steps that draw us deeper. As I have established, I hope, through the word and through the things that we have shared in the past, that every one of us is an intercessor. But we can all develop intercession within us to a deeper level. And the four steps, and I don't want to make a formula of it, but the four steps that we talk about are first, intimacy. Intimacy will draw you into identification. Identification will give you agony. And out of agony will, become author will come authority. These are the steps that uh, will move you and move your prayers into uh, areas of real authority. The church has wanted to go from the, you know, the cradle to the crown without having to go through the cross. And uh, we need, when we bear the burdens of others, it will be painful. And so in the intimacy, God will draw us into deep places in Him. You may be seated. God will draw us into deep places in Him. And out of that, there will be an identification. And we'll begin to identify with people and places. And, we're not to, and all of a sudden, we will be overtaken with empathy. Not sympathy, where we feel sorry for people, but empathy, which is identifying totally with the pain of, of, of one another. This is totally biblical. It says if one member hurts, we all hurt. If one rejoices, we all rejoice. Of course, we have to get into that level of, of uh, unity, which the church is not really very that familiar with. And one of the things that I discovered early in intercession is I didn't feel like we had enough of an identification with Israel. And uh, so what we began to do was play Israeli music in our intercession. And because the soul of man, all of us, it, within the soul realm, have a certain preference for music. Amen? I mean, music is appreciated by all people. Some form of music people we all identify with. Quite often it'll be the DNA of, of, our, of our heritage. But when we began to play the Israeli music, we would play Paul Wilmer music and so on, I noticed that our intercessors began to dance the Hora and we began to enter into the worship. And out of that began to be birthed an identification with Israel. And it, there began to be an identification with, in, in intercession that draw, drew us into a, a true empathy for them. And this was quite phenomenal to me. Of course, we understand that the soul realm is the part that receives, and the soul being the intellect, the personality, the, the actions, our, our will, and so on. That part of us identifies with music. But when, when it's music that comes from the Lord and, and God begins to translate it in the realm of the spirit, then it begins to enter into our spirit. And it's no longer just in the realm of the mind, but God begins to touch our spirit. Well, I said if that worked with the, with the Israeli music, how would it work with Irish music? So we began to play Irish music. How would it work with African music? We began to play African music and so on and so forth. So we have a collection and are still collecting music from all different nations. And uh, when I travel, I, I collect musical instruments from anything I can pack in my suitcase. <laughs> or sometimes have shipped to me, I will purchase in other countries. And um, it's to bring an identification with the nations of the world. You don't have to leave your churches or you don't have to even leave your house to be able to travel by the Spirit into other nations and pray effectively. Amen? Our, our prayers have wings and they can land in different nations and upon different people. And I challenge you to develop intercession in you to a deeper extent. And this will be again where the harps and the bowls come together. The worship and the intercession is intertwining. And this was a wonderful uh, lesson that God has given to us. And so that one was from um, fire, it's called a fireland. And it was um, done up in Belfast. Now we know that there's a little bit of a problem in Belfast. But in the actually the region that they were in, it was called the Valley of the Angels. Because at one time, when the prophets came, St. Peter, uh, St. Patrick and so on, when they came and they began to evangelize Ireland, they saw that valley filled with angels. And the Lord had spoken to us early in revival, not to look at where, where the enemy is moving. When we map or we, or we look at the designate, designated areas in our city, let's not be trying to chase the devil. The Lord challenged me with, look at where I have moved and I will move again. So I think it's Lou Ingalls that calls it opening up the old wells. The Lord, the description he gave me, he said, is look for my image. For wherever I have moved, wherever I have, I have poured out my spirit, there will be a residue 
or an image of myself that's remaining there ever so faintly because oft times you know you can't even hardly recognize it because they'll go and build a porno shop over where there was a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost that's the devil's tactic you see he will come and he will try to put up a, a smoke screen over what God has done he's a liar and he has absolutely nothing original everything that he has he has stolen from Almighty God and we are about repossessing it aren't we amen so when we, when we go to other nations, I always ask, have you had a major move of God here before? Has the Holy Spirit moved? And that's why I'm very hopeful in California, because there are many places where the image of God just is waiting. And, and, and in your cities, I'm sure you've probably had, had revivals and moves of God, maybe in your own church in the history of it. Begin to look for the positive. Begin to look for God. Let's, uh, the devil is very obvious. Let's look beyond that. Let's look for God. I, I will submit to you, and this is not my message this morning, this is just kind of a P.S. at the beginning. <laughs> Let's see, that would be a, a, well, no, I don't want to say that word, a beginning. <laughs> yeah, a postscript, this we wouldn't want to, okay. Anyway, um, this is a beginning script, okay, uh, not a P.S. But anyway, when, when, we, when we begin to understand that God in this hour is desiring to take back all of the territory. He is a God of real estate. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that is therein. And he is going to use us as repossessors of his land. And I want to submit just one, one thought here, and it will tie in very well, I think, with our message this morning. When Abraham made covenant with God in what is in the area which is now considered the West Bank, when God made covenant with Abraham and told him that that land was his and as far as the eye could see, the Lord caused such a, a reaction and a response in Abraham that he built an altar. You can read about it in Genesis, the 12th and the 13th chapter. It was in the area of Bethel, which is like I say now in the area that, that they consider the West Bank that is in, that is in um, dispute right now in the Middle East. And upon that land is where the Lord spoke to him in Bethel. And he built an altar. He took stones and he built an altar. And then the Lord reconfirmed it in chapter 13. And Abraham had gone back to that same place to worship the Lord. Now two generations later, Jacob, who is a man that doesn't really know the Lord, he's a man that um, has a prophetic mandate upon his life and, and a manipulating mother, Hear that, ladies? A manipulating mother, she knew what God's plan was for the young man, and she wasn't going to wait for God to do it. She was going to help it. Help God along. And ladies, gentlemen, I want to add a little postscript here that we need to let God be God and not try to be God in our children's lives or in the lives of, of friends and so on. We need to let the Lord do it in his time and in his way, even though we, have, we prophetically understand what the destiny is. I personally don't think Jacob had ever had a personal experience with God. He knew about God, he knew he was under a prophetic mandate, but just his very actions show the lack of integrity. We see that his, even his very name, Jacob, which means a, a, a uh, heel grabber, a, a deceiver, he, he uh, was able to swindle his, brother, his brother's birthright, and then he and his mother conspired together to get the blessing. And after, after that happened, mom had a big revelation. She says, son, I think you need to go over to Padanaram. You need to go over to, to some of my far relatives, and you need to get yourself a wife. She's trying to get him out of town before Esau got him, right? Because Esau was angry. And so Jacob proceeds, and en route, he passes through Bethel. And without his knowing it, and we read the, the account of it in, in Genesis, the 28th chapter, without any understanding of what was happening, he stopped to sleep at that night, and it says that as he slept, he saw that there was an open heaven over the very geographical place where his grandfather had made covenant with God two generations before. He saw the angels ascending and descending. He even, it, 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 uh, it indicates there that one of the stones became his pillow. And I like to think that one of those stones were perhaps one of the stones that Abraham had built the altar to Almighty God when it was a covenant place. And Jacob woke up in the morning and he said, Surely God was in this place. And I did not even know it. And I would submit to you, beloved, that there are places all over this globe where God is in that place and we don't even know it. 
Maybe the very place where you're having church right now, maybe the very city that you're in has had a tremendous move of God. The Lord is only waiting for us to come and to reaffirm because Abraham, uh, uh, Jacob at that point, he reestablished covenant with his God. He received a personal revelation that changed his life forever. He, he knew then it was not just something someone else told him about it. He had his own personal revelation and relationship with God. When we go back to those places or we go to those places, that's why you hear people going to Azusa Street. And you hear people going to, to um, Amy Simple's place in, in um, Angelus Temple and, and people going to places in New York and, and, and in, your, in, in different cities and, and praying and making covenant, repenting in those places, beginning to worship and ask God to revisit those places that he has left his image. And so I would encourage you when you go back home, learn a little bit about your city, learn about your church. I, I can't hardly think that there's any church, no matter how dead it is, no matter if you think it has Ichabod written over the top of it, that somebody had a vision, somebody had an inclination, somebody had an urging, hopefully from God, to establish a work there. Albeit they've had church splits and this and that, and that's what most people are worried about. How are we going to get the demons out after the... Oh, honey, when you begin to establish a place of purity, he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, that's the first prerequisite. If we will humble ourselves and say, God, I'm a sinner, and I stand, oh, Lord, oh, vicariously for those that have sinned in this place, I ask your forgiveness. Oh, yes, the prophets did that. They interceded for their people. They vicariously stood as intercessors and said, God, forgive the sins of my fathers. Forgive what has happened. And what it does is it clears the way. Every person, of course, has to ask for personal forgiveness. But what happens in the atmosphere is when you, as a man or a woman of God, filled with the love of Jesus Christ and purity of purpose, repent for yourself and for the sins of those that that have gone before you and you begin to ask God to revisit those places make new covenant with him oh and begin to worship almighty God the heavens will begin to open over that place it's all about having an open heaven as chaplain was sharing last night the different reasons why God moved and has moved over this church and all of those reasons have contributed to why there is an open heaven you know it when you come in here you feel immediately the presence of God. And we are, we are so possessed, shall we say, with a desire to have God continually in our midst that it's a place of constant repentance, a place of constant worship, a place of constant covenant so that the heavens will remain open in the glory of God. If we could get the heavens opened over a whole city, do you know what would happen? We're working on that. I, I had something called United in Prayer for Pensacola. We're not satisfied that God's brought revival just to our, our church, though this is glorious. This is, and maybe 500,000 or, you know, we've had 4 million people come. That is a drop in the ocean. What about if our whole city begins to be touched by God? What about if while people are shopping in the mall, the conviction of the Holy Ghost begins to grip their hearts and they begin to fall on their knees and cry out like it's happened in past revivals and said, oh God, save me, I'm a sinner. People have to pull their cars open over, over to the side because they're weeping so de in such a desperate need for God. Then I'll say revival has come to a city. I'll say the presence of God, oh yes, has visited a city. We've seen that to a small extent, but the prophetic word has always been the city of Pensacola, not just our church. And we're not going to be satisfied until we see every, every church in this city. We have no, no jealousy and, and wanting to hold this to ourselves. We want the doors to be open like he talked about and, and walking around out there on the street, summoning God's presence so that he will visit every church, every place that names his name and lifts up and worships Jesus will have an outpouring. Oh, I mean, beloved, think about this. If just the backsliders came back in your city, there wouldn't be enough churches to hold them all. Hallelujah. 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 We want to challenge you with that this morning. The title of our message for poor Fred back there is called Worship and the Woman at the Well. And the Gospel of John, turn with me please if you will, if you have your Bibles. We're going to be reading the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter. 
the second through the 19th verse. Father, I ask as we approach your word, you would open the eyes of our understanding that we might see, that we might catch a greater vision of your purposes and of your glory. God, that we might apprehend what you desire to apprehend. Lord, that we could sit in heavenly places with you and that we, oh God, might come to know you and the power of your resurrection in a greater way. Lord, we embrace your cross today and we say how wonderful it is to daily be able to wake up and say, I take my cross today for it is not a wearisome thing. You've said that your yoke is easy, your burden is light. But Father, we want to remain. We remain very close, very, very close to you and the revelation of your cross. And Father, I just ask that you would open our ears to hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church in this day. Not what he spoke yesterday, not what he spoke last month, not what he spoke five years ago or ten years ago, but what are you saying to us today? You've said that your sheep know your voice and they will not follow another. We know that these are precarious times, Lord, and we know that there are many voices out there, but Lord, single our ear to hear only your voice. Father, and I ask that our hearts would be fertile ground, pure hearts, well-plowed hearts for the planting of the seed of your word that it might bring forth the intended harvest in due season. John chapter 4, verse 2 through 19. He, Jesus, left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. This place is remarkable in the scriptures. I wanna, uh, I'm not going to do it the theological way, the way we're, we're taught in Bible school, you know, where we read the whole thing and then we go back and, oh, well, maybe I should. <laughs> but then we have to read it twice. Okay. Oh, let me go ahead and re I'll read the whole thing, then we'll come back and make our comments. So you won't think I'm totally ignorant. <laughs> not totally. You've already figured out pretty. <laughs> don't you love, don't you love Chaplain Robertson? <laughs> you know, I have to, I have to do a little, a little side trip. I'm, I'm one of those with rabbit trails, so you'll probably have to buy the tape to figure out what, what in the world the old lady said. But I mean, you know, when, when the, when the rabbit trails, you know, they, they just pop through my head. Thank God I don't say everything that pops in my head. I mean, <laughs> I'd lose you pretty quick. But anyway, uh, I remember coming here and, and God had graced us into the revival. We came in three months after the revival started. And when we, um, we have been in Pentecost, as I said, for many years, and so the shaking and the jerking, none of that bothered me. I mean, I'd seen it, you know. I mean, if you've been in Pentecost that long, you've seen a lot of stuff. And in fact, I, I call myself a holy roller. The night I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I rolled on the floor and laughed for about two hours. So I was a genuine holy roller. And, but I had, you know, I had become very very didactical in my in my teaching i had become very homiletical all of that you know wanting to oh in the greek and the hebrew and the you know i mean i don't read it but i have a strong's and i can't read english <laughs> you know now i have pc bible soft which really makes it easy but in those days you know it was like i will do it if i can see it in the word i mean that was my and I still believe in the integrity of the word. I love the word. I read it every day. I, I love God's word and all of its wisdom. But I think maybe there was a little bit of arrogance. And when I was asked to come, you know, I, I did not criticize anything that was going on because I knew it was God. But I was with a group. Oh, we were a few, oh, say two or three months into the revival, I would say, on our part. So that would have been close to the end of 1995. We came in September. So this was probably November or, or so on. And... Um, I was teaching a class on intercession in, in, in the back room, in the choir room, and I had a whole group that had come from another state, a whole group of intercessors that were sitting there that day. We had about 75 people in the room. And I made this statement. I said, you know, I believe the shaking and the, and the jerk, all that. I said, I believe that that's God. That's man's response to God's presence. Man's, re man's response to God's presence. I said, I personally have never done it, but I do endorse it, and I believe that, I believe that this is valid. Well, there must have been just a little bit of arrogance in that. <laughs> the next morning, Sunday morning, God reserved me for Sunday morning. While Pastor Kilpatrick is preaching, I fell out in the aisle over there, and I began to jerk. <laughs> 
I mean, I'm the original jerk, you know? I mean, I was just jerking, and I couldn't stop. My whole body's jerking. Now, Pastor Kilpatrick's preaching. And every once in a while, I'm sure, I couldn't tell because I'm on the floor thinking, oh, God. <laughs> and the whole row sitting behind me were those intercessors that I had been talking to the, the day before. And I, began, I was weeping and crying, and I was jerking like this. But what happened when I was doing that? I felt like chains were being broken off of my arm. Did I love Jesus? You bet. Have I served? I've served him for over 40 years, and I've never backslidden. And I'm glad to say there was never anything to go back to. Did I, was I baptized? No, yes, spoke in tongues every day. Did I move in the gifts with us? You bet. But I had bondages, folks. I had restrictions on me. So whatever it was, it, maybe it was religion, whatever, I don't know. But he was breaking some chains off of me that morning. And I felt like when I w was laying there that somebody took their hands and began to rip roots, deep roots, out of the bottom of my feet. I mean, it was, I got, I was so drunk when I sat up on the floor, I mean, I was, like Brenda Kilpatrick said, drunk as a dog. I mean, just like a dumb dog sat there. And I was so drunk, I was not only slurring my words, but staggering. This was not my usual presentation of myself. They, they picked me up, rolled me up off the floor. Thank God my husband was not there that morning. Oh, he has forever been sorry that he was out of town and could not be there that morning. Because his, his little saying about me, my wife is so bound up. I mean, you know, I mean, they tell it how it is over your wife or your husband, right? But he would say this, in, my wife is so bound up. He said, let me tell you, if they're having a healing line or a prayer line, you can be sure she's still going to be standing. Everybody would be on the floor. Oh, no, I wasn't going to do a courtesy fall for anybody. Well, he would have had that to hold over my head the rest of my life. <laughs> now he only hears it secondhand. I mean, he would have just made a spectacle of me that morning. I know my husband. So he probably would have run out and against the, the usher's plan, uh, you know, their, what they had bought. He probably would have got his camera, you know, to ah, ha, 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 here she is, you know. And he would have had it enlarged, probably put out on the Internet or something. But anyway, <laughs> that morning, I don't care now. He has no power. I mean, I got broke. They took me into the past. They, they <laughs> drugged me, <laughs> carried me, whatever, into the pastor's lounge, sat me on the, on the couch, and I'm like this, and I'm on a crying jag. Anybody ever been drunk and been on a crying jag? Yeah, well, it's better with the Lord, <laughs> I can tell you. But anyway, I was, I was on a crying jag, and my, slur my pa pastor comes in and looks at me, well, Lila, what happened to you? <laughs> I couldn't even speak. Well... <clears throat> So much for that. <laughs> we all have our stories. But uh, that was one that God just did such a marvelous thing. How could you ever criticize somebody else when you've experienced something like that? You know, my, and I used to always say, and my husband would say, oh, Lila, you are crazy. Because he's, he's a great preacher in his own right. Uh, I would say, God is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit won't. My husband said, are you kidding are you out of your cotton picking mind? Now, my husband was a stuntman for 45 years. And so the night that he got baptized, the second night after he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, the Lord threw him down on his knees. And this is a guy who liked to fight better than live. You know what I'm saying? This was just his recreation before he got saved. He gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. He, gets, he, he comes back to the Lord, gets baptized in the Holy Ghost on a Friday night. Saturday night, the Lord takes him along with a whole bunch of Baptists to a, to a place in Torrance, California, and where they were dedicating a room, and God begins to, delivers him from cigarettes first, thank you, Jesus. Okay, so anybody that might, you know, get offended by this, but anyway, you know, the, the Baptists, well, I'm not even going to go there. Anyway, they, you know, he really didn't have any kind of compunctions and and he had been praying for people and sat down to, to light a cigarette and one of the pa one of the leaders there said you know what you need to get rid of those and my husband said you know it probably would be a hindrance to me <laughs> this is how ignorant you know in the charismatic movement we were and so he um, he got delivered from cigarettes there and then he went God used him till three o'clock in the morning to deliver people yeah and he saw and did things when the Lord threw him down on his knees and said, I'm not, because he was, he, he, you know, you just got the baptism of the Holy Ghost the night before and you're speaking in tongues and, and it's pretty weird. I mean, isn't it? And I don't mean, I don't mean that offensively, Holy Spirit, but your natural mind is engaged while your mouth is speaking another language.
And his, his natural mind, he was, he was praying for somebody. He was speaking in tongues, and he, he was down on his knees. And he's a big guy. He used to double John Wayne, along with a lot of other uh, big, big heavies in the, in the motion picture industry. And when he was down on his knees and he's praying for someone, he, he said the, the thoughts going through his mind, man, you better get up off your knees or those guys with the butterfly nets are going to be here, you know, and the white coats are going to, you know, they're going to take you off and put and lock you up. So he shuts it down and he begins to get up and the Lord literally throws him as he's starting out the door. The Lord literally throws him across the room and back down on his knees. And he continued to pray. Well, until 3 o'clock in the morning for people <laughs> that are still delivered today. So what, what he would always try to tell me, Lila, the Holy Spirit is not a gentleman. <laughs> Take that out of your vocabulary. Oh, well, well, I found out that morning he didn't care that he made a jerk out of me. You know, right in front of the whole church and the people humiliated me and, you know, my pastor's trying to preach Sunday morning service. Yeah, so look out, look out. All right, now let's get back here to the Word. John 4, verse 2 through 19. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is, who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Oh, wait. The woman answered and said, I, oh, where am I? The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke, tr in that you spoke truly. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, I want us to look at the setting of where this was. This place is remarkable in Scripture, where they're having this encounter. And we're going to continue on in just a moment about the, the rest of the conversation between, in verse 20 through 26, so you can keep your finger in that spot. We're going, to, we're going to pick up right where we left off. This place where the conversation ensued, as this was the place where Abraham, or Abram, first stopped on his coming from Haran to Canaan. It was where God first appeared to that patriarch and promised to give the land to his seed. Now, remember, this is the West Bank area. The place where Abram first built an altar to the Lord and called upon his name, Genesis 12 and 17. The present name of the city is Naples, Neapolis, or Naples, or Nablus. If you're watching your newsreel, this area is Nablus, N-A-B-L-U-S. Jacob had his revelation of an open heaven in Genesis 28. Jacob gave to his son, gave this parcel of land to his son Joseph. Remember at the beginning of the encounter that we've seen in the Middle East, I think it was a year and a half ago perhaps, that they desecrated the grave of, of Joseph. Remember that? Are, are, do we watch the news? I watch the news all the time. Uh, I believe, you know, I know some people are too religious to watch television, but I, uh, I want to see what's going on with my prayers. Uh, because I believe that my prayers affect the nations. Shouldn't we believe that? That our prayers are affecting the nations? Anyway, Jacob gave this, this parcel to his son Joseph. Jo Jacob had bought this field from the chil children of Hamer, the father of Shechem, 
for a hundred pieces of silver or lambs, Genesis 33 and 19. And in it he built an altar, which he dedicated to El Elohe Yeshreel, the strong God, the covenant God, the God of Israel. In John 4 and 19, this is the place that she, that the woman at the well and Jesus had their encounter. It was called by the Romans Flavius Neapolis, and this has been corrupted by the Arabs into Nablus its present name. And this plot of ground that Jacob had given to Joseph, Joseph so valued it, and he was so emphatic when he was getting ready to die that he gave the children of Israel an indictment. He said, do not bury my bones here in Egypt. I want to be buried on that parcel of land that is covenant with my grandfather, my father, my my, my great-grandfather, my father, so on and so forth. I want my bones to be buried in that place. So the children of Israel, have you ever thought about that? They packed his bones around for 40 years in the wilderness. It was that important to him. He was so attached to that land that was covenant land given by God to the sons of Isaac. Why do we think there is such a confrontation in the Middle East over that parcel of land? Because it's the integrity of God's word and the integrity of God's promise. I am not anti-Palestinian. I am not anti-Arab. I love all of God's people. We pray for and we will meet with them. I'll be in Israel in a couple of months and we'll be meeting with, with Arabs and, and Palestinians that know Jesus Christ and Jews that know Jesus Christ. But when God's word his prophetic word that he has spoken to the patriarchs is being challenged. It's not about, it's not about people. It's not about nation. It's about God and the enemy. The enemy does not want to allow the fulfillment of God's word that that area will be repopulated by the, by the offspring of Abraham through the, through the tribe or through the, the uh, promised seed Isaac. He is fighting with all that he has within him to see that that does not come to pass. Because if that comes to pass, oh, and it's en route. You, you see, we've been living in a very prophetic time since the beginning of, the, of 19, when Azusa Street and all that. And, and if you... Uh, Read. I have a chapter dedicated in my book called Cross Pollination about the parallel between what has happened in the church and what has happened in Israel historically in the last few generations. And I think you would find it very interesting because the church is connected with Israel. We are the spiritual Israel. What happens to the natural seed is going to be very important. And I believe that God has it in his, on his calendar to pour out in revival over Jerusalem and all of the Israel, Israeli areas, such a power of his presence that it behooves us when it tells us in the word to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and it talks about the blessings that you will receive as a result of your praying for the ancient covenant people and the land. Because in the book of Romans, it tells us if the cutting off of the natural seed, the, the natural olive branch, was riches for the Gentiles, and all of us are believing and, and, and receiving that, are we not? We can be thankful for the Jewish Messiah. Amen? We can be grateful for the Jewish apostles. Do we realize that the book of Acts, where it talks about Cornelius' house, was 10 years actually after the, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost? In Pentecost, the Jews still believed that Jesus was the Messiah, or Yeshua was the Messiah, only, only to the Jews and to the Israelis. But God has included us in the covenant. He has included us as the seed of Abraham by faith. And so in that covenant, we need to pray because it says if the cutting off of them is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will the grafting in again be but life from the dead? You see... Paul continually talked about the one new man. When we read Ephesians and we read about the one new man, it's talking about Jew and Gentile. It's as if this is a great mystery. In this present day, the, the largest part of the one new man is Gentile. In those days, the larger part was Jew. And so we need to begin to pray that the veil will be lifted because the veil is going to be lifted off of the eyes. Yes, and those that... We were the ones that sat in darkness and saw a great light. And now... 
it is upon the church. Let us not be like the Jews were. Let us not be like the early church was in wanting to make uh, all the Jews, uh, all of the Gentiles into Jews. Let's not try to make all the Jews into Gentiles. Amen? Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus is the Messiah. Amen? And the veil is going to be lifted. Well, I'm on my, I'm on my soapbox, aren't I? Amen? The church needs to hear it. All we see is the media, the biased media. And unfortunately, the world buys what CNN has to say. And just yesterday, it told about what Ted Turner, who heads CNN, had to say about the area. It certainly was pro-Palestinian. Uh, pro and so we know that his, his station would surely reflect some of that, don't you think? I mean, if I owned the station, I know how I would present it. <laughs> oh, well, that's why I don't own the station. <clears throat> Jacob's well was there. And this is the area, as I said, that is in conflict right now. Now let's go on to see what the, about the greatest theological discussion about worship that we have documented in the Bible was not with one of the rabbis, it was not even with a Jew. It was with a Samaritan adulterer or adulteress at a well. Jesus had this tremendous theological discussion with just a regular sinner. Let's look at the word worship. We've already established that worship is not singing. Worship is not music. It's much more than that. And so let's look at, in the New Testament word for, for worship, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, but perhaps there's one or two that isn't. One of the, the strongest indications and, and explanations of what true worship is, it, it means to kiss, like a dog licking his master's hand. So that puts us in a place of humility, does it not? To fawn, to crouch, literally or figure, figuratively, to prostrate oneself in homage, do irreverence, or to adore to worship. In the Old Testament, the word worship is shakah, a primitive word, means to depress, prostrate, to show homage to royalty or to God, to bow yourself down to. It all has to do with humility. He said, a humble and a contrite heart he will not despise, but he will reject the proud. And that is why he is working so hard upon us as the Gentile church or, or whatever church you, or Messianic congregation, to bring us to the place of repentance and humility. Because religion will cause us to be proud. It caused an entire nation, uh, for the most part, the religious, the religious nation of the world, which was the Jewish nation and the rabbis, to miss their appointment. No wonder Jesus wept and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long? How often I would have drawn you unto myself, and you would not. Let's not let that be his mandate and his weeping for the church, because we have so much religion upon us. I hear people say, I'll never get down on the floor and, and lay down in front of, you know, the congregation or the, well, if you don't, you know, he just might knock you down and shake the, devil out again like he did me you know and so uh, if we if we're not willing to prostrate ourselves and to humble ourselves and that not only means before God but with to one another we'll never have unity among our churches and I want to throw this in because uh, I uh, <clears throat> I believe with my whole heart that God is after entire cities I think you probably surmise that but I are by what we had commented on earlier but I believe that when Jesus stood among the candlestick in Revelation he said, to the church of Thyatira, to the church of Philadelphia, to the church of Laodicea, to the church of Smyrna. He was speaking of the church that was in that city. Now, I believe that they were meeting in probably many different places in the city. But when God looked at the city, he saw them as one church. When we begin to see ourselves as one church meeting in different places then, and, and get that paradigm mind shift, and that will mean that if God chooses the local United uh, Methodist Church to bring revival, that we will be as willing to serve there as if it happened in our own church. Now, that's a challenge to us. That's a challenge to us. But we've seen that here in this community. 
At night, during, during the revival, there would be Episcopalians, and we're talking about their, their, their priests and their, and their leaders and Baptist pastors and, and Methodist people and Methodist pastors all praying at the prayer line at night. We didn't have enough people here. They began to come from all over the city, churches that joined in. And you know what? They also have a move of God in their churches too. Amen? Because they were willing to come alongside and to assist us when there were so many people coming. God loves unity. Oh, he literally loves it. He prayed. And if there's anyone that ought to have their prayer answered and will have their prayer answered, it's Jesus. He said, I would that you be one. He prayed for the unity in the body of Christ. And I want to do my part to try to serve him in that way, to help to bring unity in the body of Christ. I think that should be a paramount desire of every one of us. In John, let's look at this theological discussion that the Lord Jesus had with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. She begins by questioning him about worship. She said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mount nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. In verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, I want us to look at that. I who speak to you am he. I am he. I am Jesus was identifying who she was speaking to at that point when they were having the discussion on worship. How many of you felt the touch of God for healing last night in the meeting? And you feel like God really touched you. Amen. Yeah, all over the room. Lift your hands again. You, you, praise God. This is something that we believe that God is showing not only through the scriptures but through his presence. It's healing in the glory. It's healing in his presence because the I am he is present. The I am he. Oh, where did we first become acquainted with I am? When Moses had the encounter at the burning bush and the Lord spoke to him and gave him a mandate that he, wa he was to come from the backside of the desert. Oh, to brazenly walk in to Egypt and to challenge the Pharaoh and with mighty miracles, signs, wonders, and healing, I might add, deliver the children of Israel out of bondage and slavery across the Red Sea into the Sinai Desert where God continued with them in great signs and wonders and miracles in their entire 40-year travel. This is the I am. And I believe that he is the one that wants to begin to present himself in our meetings. We begin to get this inclination as we begin to a witness. And, and Lyndall is going to share when he, is he here? Wendell, Lind, when, is he here? Lyndall's going to share some of the things that, are, that have happened in his meetings recently too. But what we begin to see here uh, in our own, in, in uh, our own, this, this facility here, about two years or a year and a half before uh, Steve Hill left to continue on in his ministry, and we bless him and love him, and, and that was a God thing because, you know, he needed to go on with what he's doing. He was a missionary evangelist, and I'll tell you, that last couple of years, I thought the man was going to have a heart attack. He wanted to, all of us are getting to go out to nations, and he's here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, preaching, getting a fresh message every night. And his first and foremost calling was to, to uh, minister to the nations. So when he, a uh, pastor, and he agreed, and, and uh, we blessed him, and he went on to be. But the last couple of years, our people were getting tired, our workers. You can imagine. Are any of you tired from this week? When you got up this morning, did you say, oh, I'm going to sleep in tomorrow. 
We live this for five years. We live this for five years. We would go out and do meetings and come back and immediately be back in, in revival. Uh, I would leave conferences where the people say, oh, thank God this is over. Now I can rest and I can do, ha, huh, I'm catching a plane and I've got to be back here at night for, for, for the revival services. God carried us, and I'm not complaining, and I never would, but when Carrie uh, Robertson yet last night said, it's going to cost you everything, he means it will cost you everything. You had no time for social life. Uh, I had, you know, two great-grandchildren and a grandchild born during revival that hardly even know me. You know, I'm trying to get reacquainted this last year. Ah, there's Grandma. This is your Grandma. Ah, ah, who's she, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. They have never seen you. Who is this woman showing up all of a sudden? But what I do is I show up with gifts. I, and I, I find out what they like the best. Am I, am I, oh yeah, yeah. You know what, I, I thoroughly believe that everybody should skip being a parent and become a grandparent. Being a grandparent is fun. Being a parent, mm -hmm. Anyway, when, <laughs> it will cost you everything. You have no social life, as I said. You know, you barely have time for, for your husband and your, you know, I mean, <laughs> we could cut this out. But I remember the first, <laughs> uh, the first year, and we've been doing it ever since a revival started. In December, we are on hiatus, and we shut down revival. And I'll never forget the first year that we shut down for revival, there were three women that were on the worship team that came back pregnant. <laughs> Okay, in January, you see what I'm saying? So, what, I, what I'm trying to say, it will cost you everything. It will cost you everything. And so, if you're going to go the mile, you need to set your face in that way. So, we had discovered something. I specifically had discovered because I feel like I am the most fortunate person upon this campus. I had the intercessory prayer room, and I can go in there, and I know that I have people who know how to pray. And when I'd come back from trips, especially in third world countries, and you've been in, you know, with all kinds of demonic activity trying to attack you and all that kind of stuff, and I don't like to give much attention to it, but it is a reality. I'd come dragging back in here tired and worn out, and I would tell them, I'd say, just beat the devil off of me. I'd go back on the prayer room. So what they would do is they would pray over me and they would soak me. And I would just lay down in the presence of God and they would just pray over me. And I could feel all that heaviness and oppression lift. So I was the first participant in that, I believe. And then we, be, we said, you know, our people are really tired. So what we would do is after the worship service was over, be, uh, uh, before the altar call, we would invite the prayer team and the different members and workers and, and ushers and so on into the cafeteria where our intercessors would soak them. And so for the next hour or so, we would just, we would have worship music on and kind of turn, dim the lights down and they would anoint them with oil and they'd lay down on the floor and, and with a little pillow and just cover them up with a drop cloth, you know, and just let them lie in the presence of God and astounding things began to happen. Because it was a time of being quiet before God. And we began to get testimonies and people were saying, man, I have, I have received so much, you know, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but some of them said it was pretty powerful, even though they'd been in revival for five years, that what they were receiving in the back room was, was so awesome. So we began to, to get some reports of people being healed and things like that. And it began to, to challenge my mind and I thought, it's the glory of God. When God's glory and presence come and we open ourselves up to him, there's no end to what God will do. And so we, we kept that up. And now we have every, every Friday night the, or the Thursday night, the first Thursday night of every month, we have an open, inter, open meeting in the back room and we call it soaking healing prayer. And we've been doing this for a few months, and we're already beginning to get some awesome emails and some prophetic words that are, are uh, concerning what has, has been occurring. And so when the glory came in last night, Linda and I have become familiar with the presence. It's like when the angel would stir the waters, get in. Did you feel before he began to release the healing that there was like a big stirring in the midst of... And let's face it, folks... Every one of us that are, have Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit within us have the gift of healing lying resident within our own being. 
When we got baptized in the Holy Ghost, we got the whole package. Not only did we get the prophetic, but healing lies resident within us. And so as God's Spirit begins to stir, He's stirring the waters of healing in our own body. Woo! What an awesome thought. So I'm believing that God is going to begin to show us. I, one of my first experiences was two or three years ago, I was in Mexico, and we were in Puebla, and we were holding a, some, a conference, and we had about four or 5,000 women there. And uh, we had had this tremendous worship. This church had excellent, excellent worship team, and just awesome. And they drew us into a place. Am I talking to... You know, am I talking to the choir here? Do you, do you understand what I'm talking You feel yourself being drawn in. It's not just words anymore. It's not, you're being drawn into his presence. Yeah. He's being enthroned in this room, and he's making himself available, and we're just being drawn into his presence. And when, when we begin to release our sound back to him, there's just something that, that begins to be uncorked and possibility of anything happening, everything happening. The I am that Moses encountered because he asked him, what is your name? And he said, I, I'm, he wanted to know what to tell the people when he took them out of, um, out of Egypt. He said, tell them that I am that I am has sent you. He's the all-sufficient one for every need, every possibility, every, every miracle, every, he can do anything. This is the I am. The same one when they came in the garden to arrest Jesus. And they said, who are you? And he said, I am he. And what happened? They were all prostrated on the, on the ground, were they not? They fell. We're slain in the spirit, whatever term we want to use. So I do think it's biblical to fall on the ground. They fell on the ground. And when he spoke to the woman at the well concerning the subject of worship, he revealed to her that I who speak to you am he. I am I am that I am. I am the all-sufficient one for all things. So when we were in this meeting in Mexico, and the glory began to come in, now I have my interpreter on the, on the platform, and he's getting a little nervous because I just kept waiting. I, I, I could sense God's presence and the glory. God was beginning to stir the atmosphere. And, uh, and my interpreter said, you know, you're supposed to pre I said, yeah, I know, I know. Let's just wait. And so as God's presence just continued to come in, I, I, I sensed that he wanted to do something different than what we had on our agenda and what was written on the, on the uh, flyer. And so the Lord just, I just began to call out illnesses like Lyndall was doing last night. And uh, then the Lord impressed me when I stopped and I said, okay, are that, is that all the different ones that you want me to name? And he said, hey, just tell them to lay their hand upon their body wherever uh, they, they have any problem or wherever they need a healing and let me lay my hand upon theirs because I'm the healer it's not going to be because of what you said it's not going to be but but just let them lay their hand and so I told him and some people started falling out <laughs> praying for themselves <laughs> Woo! I thought this is amazing <laughs> this is totally amazing and so uh, then I began to call for those that, that had received healing to come forward and give testimony. And people started coming. And I said to the interpreter, do they understand what I'm talking about? Do they understand what I'm at? You know, so obviously by this time you have figured out it doesn't have anything to do with my faith. Okay? And I believe that God is bringing an end to the one-man show. He's wanting us to have our focus upon him. Because in this last move of, his, of, of God... He is going to be the one that gets the glory. All glory is going to go to him. It's not going to go to you or to me or to whoever happens to be officiating a meeting because the healing comes from him. It does not come from us. Although, you know, I mean, obviously we pray for the sick. There's, a, there's that, that scripture. But I believe God is going to surprise us with miraculous things. Tremendously miraculous things. And so as I was... Uh, there was one little lady, she was a, I think she was a Tahamara Indian, and she was making all kinds of racket over here because I'm having to work with an interpreter and we're asking, what was your sickness? And oh, I had lumps in my breast and now they're gone. And uh, one lady had hemorrhoids and she went and checked and they were gone, you know. And I, I mean, on and on. It was cool. I'm going, wow, how about, I said, well, what's going on over here? 
And so finally, the interpreter goes and they're talking because there was a whole lot of commotion. And he came back and he said, well, she said she was blind when she came in the meeting and she received her sight. <laughs> I go, really? Are you sure? Well, they knew right away it wasn't my faith. Amen? And so we're thinking, okay, this is a third world country. This is wonderful. And some of the, my intercessors, we, we did a meeting in Rochester, Michigan just a few months ago. And, and it, was, it was so wonderful. We were having a great time. And the worship team was awesome. Tremendously. And we, in fact, we even have a video of this. We should make that available. I don't know where Rita is. We should make that available to people uh, and uh, let them see what happened that night. And someone had whispered to me, the pastor's wife had whispered to me before I got up on the platform, and she said that someone was bringing a child tonight to be, to be prayed for. Well, I'm thinking interpretation, child, baby, okay. And so I get up to, to be, uh, getting ready to share the word, and the glory of God's moving. And so, you know, I want to wait and see what God has to say. And we had a prophetic word and, and so on. And then we just, I love it, here comes the rain. And uh, we had uh, this prophetic, uh, the, 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 the atmosphere was just literally pregnant with possibility. The glory was just hanging there. And so um, I thought, well, this might be a good time to uh, pray for that child before I preach. So uh, I, uh, I called for, bring that baby up, the one that they had asked me to pray for. Oh, well, <laughs> they come wheeling a kid in a wheelchair <laughs> up the aisle about seven or eight years old. And I'm going, uh-oh. I thought this was a baby. I was just going to pray over it. And, you know, you can't ask a baby, are you healed? You know, they're going to have to. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It's our reputation. We're worried about what, you know, <clears throat> how we're going to look in this. Well, now, when a kid is being wheeled up the aisle in a wheelchair, you know, you just may have to, <laughs> you may have to test this healing. <laughs> so we go down, and, and the glory of God is there, and, and, and I, I, I went down, laid hands on him. I didn't find out until afterwards, thank you, Jesus. That, you know, they were Methodists. They'd never been in a Pentecostal meeting before. He and his, his father came down with him. And, uh, and uh, this was all strange and new to them. Someone had told them if they'd come to my meeting that the kid would get healed. I thought, who were you? Anyway, anyway uh, so we got down and we, we, we prayed. We prayed for him. And I come back up on the platform. And I'm thinking, okay, we prayed. And, da -da -da. and uh, there, others are praying for him. And so it wasn't, you know, just me. It was, it was just the presence of God. And I come back on the platform, and I get about this far, because I'm going to go, goodbye, wheel him out, and we'll preach. And the Lord said, test me. Oh, God. Okay. So I walked down, and I asked the Father, I said, what, what can't, I think his name was Brian, what can't Brian do? And he said, well, I said, can he walk? Yeah, he said he can walk. He said he can get up and, and in the evenings he can walk. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, the kid walks. Okay, I said, well, what can't he do? He said, well, he can't run. Well, I found out later he had rheumatoid arthritis and had been in a wheelchair for two years. Thank you, Jesus, I found out later. And so anyway, um, I, I, I said, well, would he be willing? And I, I wanted to ask the father's permission. Would it be all right if we get him up uh, and, and see if he can walk and so on? And uh, the father says yes. And I said, well, ask him if it's all right. So we go through all of that. And they begin to, you know, put the little things back. And he stands up. And I take him by the hand and I begin to, to walk with him. And I'm talking to him. And, I mean, he's pretty overwhelmed. His eyes are about this big. And so he's walking very, you know, very... Um, awkwardly, wasn't he? You were there, Val. He's walking very awkwardly. And, and uh, we walk, went up and we turned around and we came back. And I told him, let's walk a little faster. So we started walking a little faster. And I said, you know what let's do? We turned back the other direction. I said, let's try to run. Well, it, at that point, he, he starts moving and then he throws my hand down and he takes off. And I turn around and I say, oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, it was awesome. I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. And I turn around, and he's gone. I think, where did he go? And there was an exit there. I thought, oh, well, he went out that exit door. No, he lapped the building. He ran, the, and he comes running down the aisle and throws his arms around his father's neck, and they begin to embrace, and it was so, it was so awesome. And I stood there, and I said, God, this is what I was created for. 
Oh, I could never get enough of this. This is what I was created for, to see your people set free and healed. And with, oh, the little boy then comes in and he hugs my neck and then he gives the testimony. I said, honey, look, give him your name and what was wrong with you. And then he said, and I asked him what, what, his, what was his problem. And he said, I had rheumatoid arthritis and threw his hand up in the air. Now, they'd never been in a Pentecostal church. Big grin on his face. And the next thing you know, he takes the wheelchair and he pushes it out. <laughs> Praise God. It had nothing to do with me. I, I was telling you all the things that I was thinking and feeling. It had everything to do with God. So what I believe we need to do is create an atmosphere. Our worship will create an atmosphere where the great I am will show up. The children of Israel, when the great I am showed up, it tells us that when they left Egypt, there was not one person lame, there was not one person sick, they were all healed before they left Egypt. Praise the Lord. I have one more scripture here. Second Chronicles 30, verse 18 through 22. This has to do with Hezekiah's revival. Remember, every revival, Israel had six major revivals after David. And every one of them, it will be prefaced with, and they, they patterned themselves after their father David. So every revival in Judah after the death of David was patterned after <clears throat> their father David, the Davidic. It says, but Hezekiah prayed for them. Now, now they've had a great, uh, Hezekiah has restored, I'll give you a little update. He Hezekiah has restored the, the, um, uh, the altars and he's cleaned out the Ashtoreth and all of the, you know, the, the uh, uh, false gods and so on. He's purified the, the priests, the Levites that are there in Jerusalem. And they've had a major outpouring in, in um, the southern kingdom, in the, in the, in the, 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 Ju the Judah kingdom. But now, the northern kingdom, which is the other ten tribes, had not received this. But what happened when Hezekiah brought his people together and they had a suddenly from God, which they had in, in chapter 29, I think it's the last verse of chapter 29 of Second Chronicles, suddenly God came. And then they began to think about their brethren, their, their distanced brethren, Israel, in the northern kingdom. And they wanted to invite them to come down and have Passover with them. This, again, has to do with the unity. And if you will remember when, when David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Israel, into Jerusalem, and put up a tent, it was all of the tribes that agreed. They had all come under David as the king, and he represents the king, Jesus. They had all come under David's reign. And when they came in and they, they agreed, they all brought up the Ark together. And this is, speaks to us because I think of the Ark uh, of the ark being carried in uh, by the Levites, of course, but with the cooperation of the different tribes. And I liken the tribes to denominations. When we begin to see that, that they represent each one of those brethren, each one of those sons, when Jacob prophesied them, they, over them, they had a different destiny, every one of them. Every single one of them was given a different place to, uh, to make an encampment or, or, or to settle in. They were all given a prophetic, different prophetic destiny. And that is like the denominational churches. I like litur liturgical churches. I really think that the Pentecostals could learn a lot about, about submission in some of the more structured churches. You know, in the Pentecostals, we're just lawless. If we don't like it, we just start our own. And uh, I, even though there's the big controversy going on in the Catholic Church right now, and, and uh, everything, you know, everything's being shaken that can be shaken, but even though that is occurring, the Catholic people, when they come to Jesus Christ, they submit to the leaders. And our Pentecostal people rebel against everything the leader wants to do. Hello. Hezekiah prayed for them because some of the tribes came down to celebrate with Judah. And it says that Hezekiah prayed for them saying, May the good Lord provide atonement, forgiveness, and pardon for everyone. He was vicariously praying for the, for the tribes of, of the north. Who prepares his heart to seek God. 
the Lord God of his father, though he is not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. In that instance, these people had partaken of the Passover without having a, a being, a being prepared according to the sanctuary. And he interceded for them. He said, God, just look at their hearts. Not the ritual that they go through, but look at their hearts and, and forgive them for not going through the, the religious uh, trappings and things that they were supposed to. Just look at their heart, God. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah and he healed the people. So the children of Israel who were present at, at Jerusalem kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with great gladness. The Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day. The Levites, yes, 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 the priests, the psalmists, okay, let's get that together. The harps, the bowls, the priests have to do with the blood and prayers, intercession. The, uh, the, uh, the Levites have to do with the worship and so on, okay, the psalmists. They praised the Lord day by day, singing to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. And Hezekiah gave encouragement to all the Levites who taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And in, in uh, verse 22 of um, one of the other translations, it says, Hezekiah praised the Levites for their skill in conducting the worship of the Lord. There is a skill that comes from God that will bring in the presence of God. And hopefully, I believe that what you've been receiving while you've been in these meetings is an impartation, not just the morning meetings, but in the evening meetings, you are receiving an impartation of the skill in conducting the worship. Amen? I wonder if um, Linda would come and share about the miraculous. Do we have enough time? Are you going to take the whole other session? Have I gone too long? 9, 30, 10, 30, 11. I think I was supposed to be finished at 11, wasn't I? Okay. God's up to something, folks. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. The I am's coming in. Uh, around here, we don't care who does what. Have you noticed that? It's like, oh, you take it. No, I'll take it. No, you take it. I'll take it. That'll be a big difference you'll see in other places. Everybody wants more of them. Is it my time yet? Uh, let's give you just about 15 minutes of, of uh, bathroom time. And uh, I want you to come back. And we're going to have some good time here at the end. At our last session, we're going to do about three different things. So just get ready, all right?